All right, everybody, welcome to the latest edition of the Daily Gunner Pod here uh, across both sides of the Atlantic, joining you from the United States. I'm Rafael, joined again, very happy to be um, with my team on in London. Sam, welcome back, Sam. Good to good to speak with you. I've actually I've been the one that's away with the pod. <laughs> yeah, not too bad, mate. I hope things been all right. Ah, uh, yes, hectic but good. And of course, uh, Ryan, welcome back. Thank you. It's, it's good to finally be back on here again. All right, uh, much to discuss, and let's let's begin with this improbable statement that none of us would have believed two months ago. Um, if we look back on the calendar two months ago, Arsenal is heading to Anfield on Saturday with a top four place at stake. All right, let's just let's just let's soak that in the 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 beauty of that statement, Ryan. Um, let's let's just begin with this first. It's improbable, but it's probable. Yeah, it's um, it's a long way from where we started off the season, isn't it? And- We've we've come back. Where, where are we seven games in the league unbeaten? It might be eight, eight. I believe. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So things are looking up, and I think uh, currently Liverpool are kind of licking their wounds as such with being battered by West Ham. I think um, I think this might be a good time to go go to play them. We're we're on a high. They just come off a, a tough loss. Um, they've got some injuries. They, they that's been rumored in the last forty eight hours. So it's all it all seems positive for us to go there and get a result. Hopefully. All right, uh, Sam. Let's just stay with that. Um, but let's talk about this club coming out of the break. We've seen this actually the beginning of this eight game unbeaten run. This catapulted them from twentieth all the way up now to fifth began coming out of a break where, you know, they'd had those three matches, they were battered by City, and then they got to, you know, I'll use Ryan's terms, they got to lick their wounds, that we got to reset, and Mikel Arteta said, we're going to work, we're going to come out of this, we're better, and lo and behold, they were. A big part of that was that he finally, in that fourth match, got to field the 11 players that he wanted to field all along. There was no COVID holdups, there was no injury holdups, um, but they've been very good at the restarts. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is to do with having a stable back five with uh, Ramsdale. Mm-hmm. Well, I say a stable back five. Um, it is to a certain extent because obviously you've got Kieran Tierney um, that may come back into into the starting eleven at Liverpool. Um, but even if he doesn't, Nuno Tavares has done absolutely superb at left back. So having that five slash six option it it gives us a solid foundation to really build build from the back and then really push up the pitch as well because one thing that this team has over um an Emery team or a late Wenger team is the athleticism in the middle of the park to deal with transitions and I feel that we're gonna have to heavily rely on that come come um Saturday um, because we all know what Liverpool like to do. They like to sit back, soak up a bit of pressure, set some traps um, in the mid, mid to high area of the pitch and allow teams to fall into that, pinch the ball and then counter-attack and rely on Salah and Mane to really get going. Now, if Mane isn't 100%, they might have put in Jota. Um, equally, he's as dangerous, I would say, uh, in that system. But if they're missing Henderson, that's a big loss for them. They'll probably put in uh, Fabinho. Uh, so it, it'll it be interesting to see the team that Liverpool field. I don't think it'll be a weakened Liverpool team as such because they've got able deputies to come in, come into their side. But... I think with the cohesion that we've got and the athleticism in the middle of the park, I think that we might be able to control them a lot better than what other teams have. And if you think about what how West Ham did it, um, sitting with Rice and Suchek in there, they broke up a lot of Liverpool's attacks and forced them into areas where 
Liverpool don't really create from. And then hit hit them with with corners. Allison looks shaky. So if you put a few crosses on him, you know, he, you just don't know what you're going to get from him. So if we're able to really exploit the weaknesses, I think that we, we're in for a joyous evening. Speaking of that, I'm going to talk to two points, and I'm going to come back to you about that, um, Sam, because you, you've just got me writing down something that West Ham did that Arsenal seems to be improving at much better with set pieces. But Ryan, I want to talk to you about um, this. We talked a lot about the Arteta 11 coming out of the close of the window that, you know, Mikel had 11 players that we looked to and we crossed our fingers and said, keep these guys healthy because if these 11 can go, we don't see much depth, but there is quality there finally. And yet here we are, and it's already been tried. Tierney is out. Jacques has been out for an extended period of time. And yet these unsung people, Tavares, uh, Lukonga, right? They're men now. They played so many matches and they played well. Yeah. And I think that was the main issue last season, though. When, when Tierney was injured, he was kind of dreading mm-hmm. and hoping for the best. Because obviously you'd put Cedric or Xhaka there, and with Xhaka playing a left back, you had a hole in midfield. But now, if Xhaka's not there, you got Sambi to come in, who has looked the part since he signed. He's been brilliant. Um, got Maitland Niles as well. You got to talk about Maitland Niles because since the, that squabble on deadline day, he's come back and he's been. Absolutely brilliant, and that's down to Arteta's man management, bringing him in, finding him a place in the midfield, and he's been brilliant. And Tavares, the biggest compliment I can play pay Tavares is we haven't missed Kieran Tini at all, and uh, that that speaks volumes. Right, we were saying this last year. I was talking to Sam about this, you know, before we came on the air. When he was injured last year, everything fell apart. Everything fell apart. Now that's down to the club not having a suitable replacement for him. And obviously now they have a quality replacement for him. But, you know, we were talking about Kieran Tierney with some justifications being probably the most, I don't know, maybe not the most valuable, but the most important player in this squad. And now he's been down, what, two, three matches, Sam. And we haven't really blinked an eye. Tavares has just stepped in and, and, um, it gets me to something I want to talk about, which is the style of play. I was watching them. Uh, I was re-watching the Leicester match yesterday, preparing for this pod. And, you know, what struck me is just the confidence of this quad. A couple of things stood out for me. First, they have 11 players, even with these substitutes, Tavares and, and Lakanga, they have 11 players now who can all handle the ball at their feet. You don't have somebody, you say clubs are going to, you know, they want to work the ball to this guy and then press him because they know he's vulnerable. He could give it up in, in, a, in a critical area. We've seen this before. We said with players like Shaka, we saw it with players like Mari, you know, maybe not as fast, not as athletic. You were talking about the athleticism. But to me is that these players, as Arsenal's like daring themselves, they, the spacing was greater than I've seen and the sharpness and they, the interchange. And every one of them not only has... The ability to dribble. Every one of them has the freedom to go on a run. We saw, we've seen Ben White in several matches take it almost from his box all the way to the edge of the opposition's box, and 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 everybody works with him. You know, we saw Tavares do that cut inside several times where there's a big cavity in the middle of the opposition's um, pitch, and then you know he actually helped set up the second goal to Smith Rowe feeding. Um, I think it was Lacazette on the right side of the pitch and then set up another good opportunity there. There's so much confidence and it doesn't matter if you're brand new. It doesn't matter if you're, you, you, you know, just coming into the league. It doesn't matter what position you play. They've all been told and they've all taken to this. If the opportunity is there, seize it attack. And this is so refreshing. Yeah. And do you know what? This, this makes me laugh because you see a lot of criticism online about Arteta's style of play or Pat, Arsenal's pattern of play and that Arteta is um, suppressing their their natural freedoms to to go for a more robotic style of play. And frankly, that isn't the case. Yes, there is a structure in place 
and that structure is to guide the players to play play in a certain pattern and have that repetitive pattern happen throughout the game. That's going to be there. Every team's got that one way or another. But as you say, if players see space that they're able to drive into, they've got the freedom to do that. And we have the footballing intelligence on the pitch, and that's right the way across the pitch through the 11. If somebody mm-hmm. goes on the inside, somebody will either drop in to cover that position or sure. the, team, the team shape will adjust. So that person or that position that's been left isn't exposed. And I think a lot of it is down to the way that the youngsters coming in, so Travaris, Lukonga, play. Because Lukonga can filter out wide. He can fit into a fullback position. He can potentially sit in front of the back three if if one of the fullback goes. So that he or Partey can essentially filter out into the fullback or filter back into the centre back, allowing one of the centre backs to go out wide. And with with this, it gives you a lot more freedom in in the squad and on the pitch. It gives you that unknown element, and that for an opposition team is extremely dangerous because if they're think if they're watching you play a pattern of play they go okay we've got got this these spacings covered out but if somebody then cuts inside and diagonal they're in big trouble because they're essentially scrambling to get their entire team shape to match that run and to do that in a split second is near on impossible so with these unexpected movements forward it gives gives us the advantage because nine times out of 10, we're driving in behind their midfield as well. So with that, we're at their back four and it makes it extremely dangerous for for them because if they come back making fouls, then that's nine times out of 10, a yellow card. So again, it's what do you allow? Do you allow the run to continue or do you stop, stop and make a single foul, take the yellow card, and then that's that player done and for the rest of the game. They can't make a, another cynical challenge. So it, it just gives Arsenal a lot a lot more options. And I'm glad people are starting to see the fruition of Arteta's plan now because with the play, we've always said here, with the right players in place, the plan will become extremely clear. All right. Building on that, right. Um, something that... Sam touched on a little earlier, and we're seeing this more, not just with the freedom and the flexibility that, you know, you see, say, the fullbacks interchanging. I remember there's a moment where uh, Tomiyasu was in the box on the left side. It was coming off a free kick, but still, and, and Tavares was on the right side. And and the team doesn't blink when they do that, and they're able to re readapt. But at the beginning of the season, when the goals were being allowed, they were flowing in and they weren't scoring. Um, You know, Arteta and his staff took a lot of abuse for their poor play against set pieces. This was in the preseason matches. They were giving up a lot of goals off corners, um, off free kicks. And, you know, they had brought in a specialist to address this. Now, suddenly, you know, as we're eight games into this unbeaten streak, we're starting to see that bear fruit. We're starting to see Arsenal score goals off corners. We're starting to see them be much more solid in that. As I think that that kind of falls through the cracks, but that's worthy of mention. These are because these are dimensions of Arsenal's play that have been lacking, certainly in the last several seasons. Yeah, and when you look at our team, it's surprising that we haven't been more dominant from set pieces like free kicks, corners. When you've got the likes of Gabriel, who's massive, Thomas Partey, Sambi, uh, Tomiyasu, who, who can get up there. And I think now we've got the specialist. I, I forget his name, but um, he's come in and I think we've scored five goals from set pieces. Mm-hmm. Since, since the start of the season and that, that's that's impressive because I think last year it wasn't until I want to say towards the end of the season we hadn't scored from a corner mm-hmm. yeah and 
And the position we're in right now, we need to be taking advantage of every um, advantage we have over the opposition. And if we've got a six foot three centre back who's dominant in the air, you should be putting in corners, whipping them into him. Right, right. Now that touches on a topic, though. Um, Sam will come back to you. You know, we, well, actually, we'll stay with you, Ryan, and then I'll bring it to Sam because um, you were saying coming in that you know that is a weakness of this club that they uh, we they have the center backs. So we've seen Gabriel start to assert himself physically, but up front there isn't that physical presence. There's speed and there's agility, but that's you said that's that's maybe the next piece to get to take this club to the next step is that i think you called them just the beast in the box talk more about that yeah i think i called uh the striker we need the big old bastard and that, <laughs> right. i think that is that is the, the the term i think we need a dominant center forward who can mix it who can go can play both ways if it's in behind, he can go in behind. If he needs to hold it up and hold off the defender, do that. With Aubameyang, he's trying to do both. And I'll, I'll pay him his dues. He's doing well at both roles. But in some games, like we saw against Brighton, he didn't really hold the ball up very well. It was bouncing off him again. He, I, I feel like he's too scared to head the ball. There's been chances where, where the ball's come into the box and he's tried an overhead kick instead of hedging it when, when it could have been a clear goal. So I think we need a mix of Aubameyang and Lacazette because Aubameyang's six foot two, very, very quick. Lacazette is five, nine, five, nine, five, eleven, but very strong on the ball. If we can find someone that's a mix of both, I think we'd be, we would have a, a very, very good front line. All right, Sam, I'm going to, give you a chance to play devil's advocate here or be the second guesser, you know, coming into the season, you know, I said it and I'll, I'll take, I'll take the loss for this. Um, you know, one of maybe the name that missed, they, they brought in all these young players, but the name that we expected that we hoped for, we're like, ah, if only they brought Tammy Abraham in. Right. Now that we've had a chance to see him play us a run of games at Roma, um, should we feel the same way? Was that a great missed opportunity given the 2020 hindsight on November 15th? Um, I'd say yes and no, because obviously at Roma he showed what he can do in the early days. He started off on fire, um, but it's tapered off a little bit. Um, but it's typical Tammy Abraham. Like He will go through a patch where he does very well, and then he'll go through a patch where he doesn't do so good and he looks clumsy things bounce off him his shots are scuffed and you know I think that with him he needs a coach that will really coach him the the base basically he needs to learn the basics of of striking <laughs> that's that's the simple simple way of putting it but I think with where we are right now would we do with him. I don't think so. He's not the type of striker that we need. He's too lightweight in that that respect. We need somebody that's going to bully defenders. Somebody that's going to go in behind or a. We need two options. We need a big bully, and we need somebody that's still strong but also quick and agile. And okay, go ahead. Finish. I'm sorry. Because I have two follow-ups, but I want to let you finish first. Sure. And with that, I think that, and I've said this to Ryan many a time, what Arsenal lack up front is a different option for different games because they're very similar in the respect of teams know what they're going to get from our forward player, and it's very easy to plan against. Okay. Give, give you first crack at this then. What name would you point to and say that's the kind of player we should be looking at whether again we'll play the pie in the sky game in a moment we'll look at the January window but certainly for the summer because we know by then Lacazette and Eddie are not going to be on the club anymore 
um, a player that's been linked to the club already, Fajarovic from uh, Fiorentina. I did have my doubts about him, but having watched him again through through Wire Scout, my my fear fears with him was pace. But looking at the way that Fiorentina played, they don't need to rely on his pace. But if he needs to get going, he motors. And he's an flat, he's he's an absolute bully. That that guy. Yeah. And he people speak about Haaland. The next name people are going to be speaking is his if he gets into a top top club. There's no, I've got no two two ways about that. If Lacazette's leaving, the person that I would like to replace him with is Jovic from Real Madrid. Because again, he's somebody that will bully bully defenses. He's strong at hold up, but also he's very clinical. And this is a criticism that's been levied at Lacazette and Alba- or and Aubameyang actually is that they're not clinical anymore. And I still maintain that. And I think if we get a striker that has that clinical aspect, we'd be laughing with the way that we're we're playing, the way that this team's set up. All right. Second question. I said there was a follow up. Um, where does Balogun fit in all of this? Is it a matter? Of, should we be patient with him? Like, what, does his is is a matter of he can fill one of these roles if we're willing to wait at one more year? He's he seems to be saying the right thing. I'm I'm willing to be. You know, he was talking this week about getting advice from players like Emil Smith Rowe to to stay the course, keep his head down, keep grinding away that his time will come. When it comes, where does he fit in this? scheme of Arsenal strikers in your opinion it's difficult to say because I per, I was against him going out on loan this season because I wanted him to fill the Lacazette role with Lacazette not going and having watched him against Brentford I don't personally I don't feel that he is 100% ready for filling that role as a secondary striker for Arsenal at the moment I think that he probably needs an 18 month loan well a six month loan somewhere this season and in the full season out on loan somewhere else in a top tier club or t- I'd say a top tier club in Germany or um, mid tier in Premier League to see how he hacks it for a full, full year. Um, for me, if he was to go away for 18 months and come back, then it's like anybody he has to do it on the training pitch. And if he does it and else, else one of them, fair play to him. But I think that longer term, if we're looking at him, most clubs have three quality strikers. And if, if he's doing it on the, again, if he's doing it on the training pitch, then he deserves the space. But if he's not, then nothing should be handed to, to a player. And I'm I'm very much of the opinion now with this club and the way that we're going. If somebody wants to get on into the first eleven, they need to fight for it on the training pitch, and that only brings more competition, and it can be better, and it gives people more drive. So, for me, I think that he really needs to go away on loan, and then come in and step it up. All right, Ryan, kick it at certainly the first question. Sam gave us his choice for that beast, okay? That ideal, that big bully striker. Who's who's your who's your man or who are your men to fill that role? So I've got two names. I think um, Isaac from Sociedad is, I think, an obvious choice. He can grow into his frame. I think he's only twenty-two still, and he's he's just going to get better and better. His hold-up play already is brilliant. And um, the second one is N Naziri from Sevilla. I've watched him quite a bit recently, and he's very, very quick. He can hold the ball up. He brings others into play, and he is a, a focal point for, for Sevilla's attack. And I think he would um, fit perfectly alongside Odegaard and uh, Saka and Smith Rowe. And to expand on Sam's uh, point of having a second striker, he chose Jovic. 
I would uh, go for Kareem Adiemi from RB Salzburg. He's uh, ripping it up at the moment. He's uh, a very, very talented boy. I, I know he's being linked to um, Brescia Dortmund and RB Leipzig at the moment. So it might be unlikely, but he would be my choice. All right. Um, now, sticking with the squad, Sam, let's come back to you. I mean, we we're talking about strikers, but it does seem that sooner rather than later, reports today that clubs in the Prem are looking at Nico Pepe as early as January. Newcastle obviously be one of the targets. I forget the second one. You, you might be able to fill me in on that. But it does seem that he's getting some suitors lined up. Obviously, he's not getting playing time, becoming more and more obvious with every week that he is a, he is a sub at this point. Saka has won the starting role on the, on the right wing. Um, who would be good for him? And if he does leave, whether sooner or later, where would Arsenal look for his replacement? What style of winger do would you see them bringing in? Um, I think I'll tackle the teams that are in for Pepe first. So you're looking at Crystal Palace, Everton and Newcastle. If we want to maximise our return on Pepe, then I think that it has to be Newcastle. But reports are saying that... Teams are apprehensive of buying him outright. They want a loan with a view to buy. Um, so it's really going to be down to Edu to um, earn, earn his coin, really. If um, we're looking at a club that's going to loan loan to buy, it, it has to be Newcastle. We've got a good relationship. Well, we had a good relationship with their previous regime. Um, so... If we want to maximise profits coming back, we have to sell to them, in my opinion. Likeness is that he'd want to go to Everton because they're more established in the league and there's not that chance of of being relegated. And again, um, an ex-part owner of Arsenal, being being the owner of Everton, we need to maximise out of them. Um, I think that Palace... We won't get much change out of them, to be honest. Um, but he might want to link up with Will Saha um, and Patrick Vieira. But it it'll be difficult to get to get money. Well, quite a lot of money out of out of clubs for Pepe. But for me, I think if we're looking at playing styles, I think Vieira's um, Crystal Palace would be ideal for him. I also think that. Newcastle would be ideal for him because they are a counter-attacking team. Pepe is a very much a counter-attacking player. Um, I had my doubts 18 months ago whether he could he could fit into a possession style style team. It's proven that he can't. So essentially you're looking at a counter-attacking team and for me that'd either be Palace or Newcastle. All right, I'll come back to you uh, on on targets, replacement targets, because you had a real juicy one when we were talking before. I wanted to let you say your two cents on that. Ryan, um, where would Pepe go? And I'll give you actually first crack at the second one. Who should Arsenal look to? Should he, let's, let's say for, let's play devil's advocate here. Let's say they find a suitor for him. Let's say Newcastle, you know, Newcastle struggling a bit and they're willing to really push for a Pepe move uh, in two months. Where, where would you send, would you send him there? As Sam kind of put them at the top of his list. And again, if he goes, what kind of player and what players, give us some names, who might re- be his replacement given Arteta's possession style? So, yeah, I'd send him to Newcastle. Uh, as Sam said, they've got the richest owners. They, they his, uh, Eddie Howe, I feel, would have a good style of play for, for Pepe. And who would I repeat? I'm going to go with Adabar Royalty. I'm going to go with Jeremy Boga from Sassuolo because he can um, go in or out. He can he can uh, play possession base. He can run in behind. He's counter-attacking. He can pretty much do it all. And uh, him or... Um, I forgot his name. Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, Jeremy Boga from Sassuolo for me. All right, uh, Sam, coming back to you. You you had a real juicy name that's familiar to everybody. 
Well, we've been linked linked to him quite a lot, and that's Raheem Sterling. Now, I think that he he probably plays better on the left. Um, I would potentially try my arm at having Martinelli on the right to see whether he's able to um, cut cut in. But ultimately, I as much as I think that Sterling would be a okay addition, I just don't think he's what we need. And to be perfectly honest, in terms of if we lose Pepe, I potentially wouldn't be looking at a replacement in the wide area. I would be looking at a striker because you've also got the option of playing Aubameyang on the wing. Gentlemen, a question that's been, we were worried about it. Now it seems it will it happen, won't it happen? I'm talking about African Cup of Nations. A lot of concern that with the window coming up, Arsenal would have to go out and find themselves a midfielder uh, because it looked like they were in, in line to lose not only strikers, people like Obama Yang, people like Pepe, but uh, people from their midfield as well. Um, what is the status of, of AFCON? And would you still prioritize that position above all else in the, in the January window? Ryan, you first. No, it looks like it's going ahead anyway. Um, so far, as far as I can read. Um, but yeah, that, that position is probably priority because we will be left with a half fit Granite Xhaka and um, Sambi and Maitland-Niles. I know they can do a job for three or four weeks, but any suspensions, Sambi loves the yellow card. So he could be get a suspension. And um, I think the games that we're likely to be missing Partey are, I believe, City at, at home, Spurs away and Burnley at home. So mm. that's that they're they're three very tough games. So we I think we probably need a central midfielder to come in and 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 just to push us over the line because if we're in a good spot in January, uh, like for top four or, or more, that little extra push that the morale boost of a big sign in in January could really help this team get get over the line of, of Champions League football. So, yeah, I think central midfield is probably the priority for me. Sam, notoriously difficult to get a significant signing, important signing in January, just because a lot of players aren't available and those that are teams know you're desperate and they'll jack the price up to an astronomical rate. Um, might Arsenal go the loan route in January and say, let's get somebody you know, a, a club might be willing to loan us this player for the rest of the season starting in January in the midfield. Um, potentially, but I think with, with loan options, it's, it's very difficult because obviously um, teams are not going to loan out one of their start, starting players. And if we look at it um, realistically, there are some good deals to be had. Um, in January, considering that players are out of contract in the summer. And for me, if we're looking at players like that, we I'd be looking at Babacar Kamara from Marseille because with him, and I know that he's a favour of Ryan, he is a very dominant centre midfielder. And he, again, he's a, another young player. Um, he would have had the the experience of playing with Saliba and he I believe would fit in nicely next to Partey anyways or you're looking at a player that was linked last summer and that's Denis Sakura because again any other names a, sorry I think with Zachariah he's somebody that's able to go box to box and people were clamoring for um, Basuma, uh, uh, Brighton. I think Zachariah is a very similar player, but I think that he's got more drive going forward and he's a bit more rounded than what Basuma is at the moment. Um, and having said that, for a further name, there's your other answer, Basuma. But I know that he's potentially going off to the Cup of Nations with Marley. Yeah, 
Um, but if he isn't, then you'd knock at Brighton's door to see what they're saying. Ryan, uh, Ryan any other names you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, Renato Sanchez has been linked in the last couple of days. Depending on price, I think uh, he might be a, a decent sign-in. Uh, you've got Aaron Ramsey. He could uh, potentially be available in a free transfer. and Or you could just look closer to home and sign Jack Wilshere on a, on a pay-as-you-pay contract. I didn't hear the name Bruno Grimarch, which we, we've kicked around a bunch in the past. Is there any particular reason he's not mentioned by either of you this time? Uh, to be honest, I completely forgot. <laughs> there are a lot of names, so it's, it's no fault of anybody. So um, um, is, is he still desirable? I haven't, I haven't had a good look at Ligon this year. So he was certainly a name to be kicked about in with legitimacy in the summertime. Yeah, I've watched Leon quite a bit for a while, as Sam doesn't like. Um, but he hasn't really stood out for me, really, in, in the games I've watched. But that's not to say he's not a good player, but for me, I, he didn't stand out as a, as a player that would um, come in and actually make a statement. Like Sam, Sam, Sambi's come in and been that guy. Uh, already, yeah, and uh, I'm I'm just not sure if if Bruno G would come in and and do that. I might be wrong, but from what I've seen, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, um, I'm gonna wind it back toward towards Liverpool. But a question that we were kicking about before we we started recording, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the confidence, the play the athleticism and that they've, they've kind of expanded their play as they trust each other more to almost to give each other freedoms. Like I want to give you space. I trust you'll get me the ball. I'll get open for you. You'll get open for me. You'll take, you take the role. We talked about that as I think Sam was talking about that a couple of pods ago is this is the evolution as they play together, they're going to gel more. We're starting to see that, but what's the next phase without bringing in anybody in um, what, can the 11 at hand do to take their next step? Sam, I'll start with you. Um, I, as you mentioned uh, before we jumped on, I think uh, Saka adding to his goal, goal tally. Um, I think Odegaard, if he comes in at that number 10, for him to start adding to his goal tally as well um, and trying to unlock Orba a bit more. Um and get him to be scoring from open play because I think that if he's able to get a few few goals from open play, his confidence might rise. But if that isn't looking likely, then I I know you said not to bring anybody in, but I have to yeah, be just for argument, just for argument's sake. I do think they're going to bring somebody in, but, but but I'm just saying between now and the opening of the window, we, yeah. we're going to expect in the next month, the next six weeks, more improvement. I would hope. So, to be honest, I'd like Martinelli to come in and get a few more minutes, but I think that given the state of the wide areas, I think that that's pretty locked down at the moment. Um, but hopefully, he can make um, some half hour cameos here and there. Um, I think, I think, yeah, I just think adding goals to that attacking, not the um, front line, but the secondary line. Right, Ryan, I'm going to give you free reign with this, but I also want to kind of put a little bug in your ear because you've been for just so long just a champion of Emil Smith Rowe, and he's developed one of the things we have seen in improvement, certainly in this in this streak, in this eight-game streak. He's gotten a real taste for the goal now. Something we hoped would happen is starting to happen. He's a real poacher uh, of mistakes in the box. Can he get even better still in that run? Assuming so- we're hoping Saka makes that step, but what what's what's next for Emil? Just consistency, consistently performing at the level he is and making, uh, putting his stamp on the game, on every game. Like you're seeing him now, he's scoring winners, like winning games, scoring goal, uh, yeah, winning games with his goals. Like against Watford, we don't win that game if he doesn't score. And 
that's that's it for him. All he needs to do now, he's got the ped- he's got the um, opportunity. He's taking it to keep going, keep consistently performing, and uh, he's only going to get better. Okay, open ended question though, because I did, I didn't want to just preclude anything else. What else would you look for? Well, from Smith Row or in no, from from everyone as the next you know the next step. What what's the next step in in their improvement in their in their upward curve, shall we say? I don't think you look further than um, the opposition on Saturday. You look at Liverpool and how they built their their eleven, where they came from from then to where they are now, just dominating, dominating teams, learning how to see games out, learning how to kill games off early, and then suffocating the opponent. I think that's what's coming next. I think the the suffocation of opponents and just beating them in the first 20 minutes is a, uh, we've seen it a little bit against Spurs. We beat them in the first half an hour, but I think uh, Leicester as well. Right? Yeah. Doing yeah. that consistently is uh, what's coming next. And as Sam said, them gelling together, all being around the same age, growing together, playing and experiencing the same things at the same time. It's only going to make this core uh, stronger. All right. Final word, gentlemen. We're in injury time of the pod. What? First off, do you expect a result at Anfield? Give me a prediction. Sam, we'll start with you. Um, I'm going to go 1-0. One 1-0. All. One all. All right. <laughs> Ryan, what, what do you see? What does your crystal ball tell you? What's, what, are we gonna, what, what are we going to get coming out of Anfield? Um. Ah, see, I'm I'm a stupidly optimistic in these types of games. Uh, I'm going to go three one Arsenal. Okay. okay. All right. Well, you know, Aaron Ramsdale gives us reason to believe. The back line with their week by week improvement gives us reason to believe. I still, I I do think you know they're they're not going to be intimidated as you both said. Their their tendency now, certainly in the streak, is to come out and just attack in those first 15, 20 minutes. They want to put you down. They don't always succeed, but they're, that's, they usually struggle against teams like Watford they're, that are going to sit back. You know, Teams like Burnley, you look at the half, it's nil-nil. But against the better clubs, I was saying Leicester, they were up 2-0 almost immediately. Against Spurs, they were up, what, 3-0 very quickly. So why not? I mean, is, is, is that the way... It's, it seems that you're playing into Liverpool's hands if you do it that way, Sam. But how, how can Arsenal have, say, a measured attack to open a match? Um, I think that it's it's not to go too gung-ho. We need to have um, two people sitting and just let, let the front three, four um, do, do their thing, really. And really, yeah, it's the overcommitment. Because if we overcommit, then you know what Liverpool are like. They'll f- find and exploit the space. Um, so I think if we have a solid base, um, two, two with the protection in front, and then allow our attackers to do, do their thing, I think that's, that's the way that we're going to get success against Liverpool. All right, Ryan, you get the final word. How do you attack without being too aggressive against a, a club that's that's just hoping you come out will gung-ho no 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 fear but no reason it just attacks them uh, i think i feel like you you'd have to um press them quickly don't give them the space they want because they came to the emirates last year and we sat off them we didn't really lay a glove on them and they battered us, absolutely pummeled us. So I think um, Sam's right. You have two sitting in midfield. You've got your uh, inverted right back with Tom Yasu. And I think I feel like you press with your front three thoroughly. You, you go in together as a unit and just keep hounding them into mistakes because I feel like they've got mistakes at the, at the back. You press them into a corner that we could score from, press them into a mistake we can take advantage of. So, yeah, I think um, the front three are going to be vital. Abamyang, Saka, 
Smith Rowe, Odegaard, whoever it is, um, Pepe even, they're going to need to um, press quite quite quickly. All right, and so optimism, optimism. I think you both gentlemen have given us results. I was going to say 1-1, one, one, Sam took that. So just by default, I'm going to split the middle. I'm going to say 2-1 Arsenal, I and mean, why not? Um, again, Ramsdale gives me hope in just about every match at this club that he'll steal a goal. I was going to say 2-2, two, two, and I thought, well, Ramsdale will take one of those away. So um, I'm, I'm going to sit on that. All right, we'll, we're all, we'll all wear our Arsenal-colored glasses here, and we'll come back next week and hopefully be able to discuss another result, another march up the table. Because as we said at the beginning of this match, a result will probably keep Arsenal in fifth. A, a, a victory, <sighs> almost afraid to say it, I feel like Jinxus, we're in the top four. And we're talking about a club in the top four. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's wish it to existence. All right. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for, for all this time. We want to thank all of you out there for watching the pod and come back and join us. Obviously, we hope to have more great Arsenal news to discuss a now nine-game unbeaten streak. Uh, and on that optimistic note, we're going to close this episode of the Daily Gooner Pod. I'm Raphael. He's Sam. He's Ryan. We bid you all a good evening.